Let me call this uh, hearing to order. The committee meets today to consider the nomination of General Randy George to be the next Chief of Staff of the United States Army. General, congratulations on your nomination. I would like to welcome your wife, Patty, son, Grant, and daughter-in-law, Hannah, and daughter, Andrea, and son-in-law, Timothy. We are grateful to your family for the many years of support for your service, and would also like to recognize and thank Senator Ernst, who will be introducing you shortly. Let me also thank the outgoing Chief, General McConville, as he prepares for retirement. The nation is safer, and the United States Army is on a path of generational transformation because of his leadership. General George, the committee welcomes your nomination to serve as Chief of Staff of the Army. As the current Vice Chief, you have helped lead the Army through a critical period of modernization. Previously, as the Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense, you gained a valuable understanding of how the Department requires the Joint Chiefs and combatant commanders to work together in support of the National Defense Strategy. You bring extensive command experience, having led at every level from platoon to corps, including in combat. You also have important analytical and force management expertise from both an Army and Joint Force perspective. These experiences make you the right person at the right time to lead the Army. The Army is in the midst of its most significant modernization effort in decades. The service pursuing an aggressive strategy called Army 2030, defined by the adoption of multi-domain operations and return to large-scale formations. The Army is shifting to a division-based configuration that will need to operate in what you have described as dispersed, mobile, and low-signature teams. To remain competitive with China and Russia, the Army must continue to invest in cutting-edge technologies that will define future battlefields. Specifically, the Army has been pursuing modernization in key areas like long-range fires, air defense, vertical lift, and deep sensing. These are ambitious and far-sighted objectives. I'm particularly encouraged by the Army's recent creation of a new cross-functional team focused on contested logistics. This team, under the direction of Army's Futures Command, will address the need for more resilient and agile logistics in dangerous environments like the Indo-Pacific. General, I would like to know your plans to continue the Army's modernization efforts and what resources are needed to support them. Even as increased resources are being allocated for the Indo-Pacific region, including for sea and air capabilities, the Army is being relied upon to provide a reliable presence around the world. In particular, the Army is providing significant support to operations in Europe, from logistics to rotational forces and command and control elements. We are reminded every day in Ukraine that combat credible ground forces are fundamental for deterrence. With that in mind, I am interested in hearing about your view of the Army's mission globally and how you would adjust its operating concepts and force posture to support the national defense strategy. Perhaps your most pressing challenge, however, will be addressing the Army's recruiting crisis. I would argue that all of the military services are facing their most severe recruiting challenges since the establishment of the all-volunteer force 50 years ago. Last year, the Army fell far short of its recruiting goals, and the same appears likely this year. There are a number of factors contributing to this challenging recruiting environment, including low national unemployment rates, lingering problems from COVID-19, and historically low numbers of Americans eligible for or interested in military service. I understand the Army is conducting an overhaul of its recruiting and retention practices, including the launch of a major new marketing campaign and the expansion of the Future Soldier Prep Course. I would ask for an update on how you plan to recruit a broader pool of potential recruits, if confirmed, and grow back and strength in the coming years. Further, I would like to understand how the Army plans to modify its current structure to account for reduced end strength in the near term but eventual growth to support the advanced capabilities being developed through the Army's modernization efforts. General, these complex challenges will require the full complement of your skills. Thank you for your willingness to continue your service and lead the Army at this critical time. I look forward to your testimony. Uh, let me recognize the ranking member before I recognize Senator Ernst for her introduction. Senator Wicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And General George, I uh, extend my Congratulations to you and your family on your nomination. Um, I welcome your wife, Patty. And um, 
I understand she's your West Point sweetheart, as well as your children, Grant and Andrea, and their spouses, Hannah and Timothy. Welcome to you all. Uh, I'm uh, going to have a little family reunion myself this weekend, and so it's good to, to see a family together. The President has nominated you, Vice Chief uh, Staff of the Army, um, to take the post of Chief of Staff pending Senate confirmation, which I hope will come quickly. I believe you are a great choice for this role and its associated duties. Your leadership is battle-tested, as the Chairman has already mentioned, having served in several major military operations throughout your career. You've also worked alongside a range of allied and partnered militaries, experiences that will surely be of value in our global military competition with the Chinese Communist Party and the Russian Federation. It's no secret that this is a very dangerous national moment, perhaps the uh, most dangerous national security moment since World War II, a claim affirmed by many leading general flag officers who have testified here before this committee. The Army must resource multi-theater, deterrence missions, expansive work with the allies and partners, and a large homeland defense mission set. The Army is stretched thin as its portfolio grows. During the current war in Ukraine, the United States Army has acted as a NATO shield to further aggression. The Army's constant and enduring presence in Central Europe has proved essential for deterrence, disaster response, logistics operation, and military-to-military -military training missions, including training the Ukrainian armed forces. Mississippi's own National Guard is in Europe now supporting these causes. I welcome your thoughts on what else the United States could do to enable Ukrainian success, including your thoughts on the provision of attackums and aerial denial munitions. Um, however, we cannot discount the many struggles the Army faces. Uh, and again, the Chairman has indicated um, an interest in this, this troublesome fact. Recent reporting indicates the Army is set to miss its fiscal year 2024 recruitment goal by some 30 percent. The Army has also been uh, delinquent, General, in delivering Congress its total Army analysis. The purpose of the total Army analysis is to give us, the lawmakers, a more accurate picture of future unit organization projections for the service. I, I'm going to be asking if you can give us some assurance that um, the um, legislative branch will be uh, given some respect in following the law in this regard. The Army has improved its procurement process in recent years, but there's more room for progress. I'm encouraged to see that parts of the Army are diligently revitalizing our industrial base, but I remain disappointed that we are not doing everything in our power to resource the industrial base. In FY24 alone, we could invest an additional $1.4 billion into the Army's munition industrial base, and every penny of that would be well spent. This funding would establish a steady production line for Switchblade 600 weaponized drone by another Patriot missile defense launcher and expand the capacity of the production line for extended range Gimlers. There's also much more to be done in the Indo-Pacific. The European Deterrence Initiative funded a wholesale change in Army force posture in Europe, and we need a similar change in the Indo-Pacific. We have yet to make the investments necessary to build the Army posture we need on the first island change, chain. In particular, I'm worried about the state of our logistics plans for which the Army has the functional lead. Um, so, General, I would like to hear your articulation of the Army's role in the Indo-Pacific, including in contested logistics and what you would like from Congress in achieving this vision. Tell us what you need, and we'll try to get it to you. As the country's largest and oldest military service, the Army will inevitably play an integral role in the future of our national defense around the globe. I'm hopeful that you will be able to lead it through this dangerous period, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Wicker. Senator Ernst, please. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Wicker, and distinguished members of the committee, 
It is my privilege today to introduce my dear friend and a native Iowan, Randy A. George, for his nomination to be Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. As a veteran of the Iowa Army National Guard, I know firsthand that the role of the Chief of Staff of the Army is one of the most important in the military. I believe General George is the right man for this critical job. General George had humble beginnings growing up in Alden, Iowa, a town with just over 700 residents. He joined the Army straight out of high school as a junior enlisted soldier. He had a great eagerness to learn and later commissioned from West Point in 1988 as an infantry officer with a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. Later in his career, he attended the Naval War College and eventually became an instructor. General George is a decorated warfighter with extensive combat service, including in the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the war in Afghanistan. He's an experienced leader, holding command at every echelon in and out of combat. In 2008, he commanded the 4th Brigade Combat Team in the 4th Infantry Division while in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Later in 2017, he returned to Afghanistan, this time commanding the entire 4th Infantry Division. Most recently, he commanded I Corps, managing daily activities for more than 44,000 soldiers to deploy, fight, and win decisively in the Indo-Pacific region. Throughout his service, General George never shied away from difficult tasks and completed them with distinction. He's a skilled joint officer, having served in the Joint Staff J3 and responsible for geographic combat operation. And he's distinguished himself as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, a position he assumed in August. In this role, General George has been instrumental in helping lead our great U.S. Army. As new threats emerge, our Army must maintain highly trained and lethal forces to fight and win the nation's wars. And I have full confidence that he understands the requirements of our Army at this critical time. If confirmed, General George will spearhead Army modernization to deter or, if necessary, defeat great powers. General George is also laser focused on the betterment of our Army, from recruiting and retention to readiness and training. He knows the needs of soldiers and their families. General George is a hardworking public servant, but I would be remiss not to, to not mention that General George is also a great family man. It truly takes an extraordinary family to serve in our military, and I would like to thank his wife and West Point classmate, Patty, and their two children, Grant and Andy, for their selfless commitment and support over the years. I firmly believe that General George's qualifications, record, and character, and of course, his great home state, make him the right nominee to serve in this important role. General George has my full confidence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ernst, uh, not only for your introduction, but for your service. Thank you very much. He testified. <coughs> General George, I'm pleased your testimony. Okay, um, first, thank you, um, Senator Ernst. Um, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, members of the Senate Armed Services Committee, I am humble to have been nominated to serve as the 41st Chief of Staff of the Army. And I want to thank you all up front for your steadfast support of our soldiers and their families. I know this has already been done, but I'd also like to introduce my family. My wife, Patty, is behind me. She's my West Point classmate. And yes, by every measure, she was the better cadet. She has been uh, my toughest critic and biggest fan for 34 years of marriage, and she's kept our family strong through numerous moves, deployments, and assignments. She's also been a friend and a mentor to many military spouses over the years. Our two kids are behind uh, me as well. Our son, Grant, whose hair is now too long, 
who served in the 4th Infantry Division and the, and the Ranger Regiment, and he's here with his wife, Hannah, and my daughter, Andy, and her husband, Tim, are also joining us. Patty and I joke that we gave our kids the opportunity to attend three different high schools. We do believe that it made them tougher and more adaptable, and I know they're both very thankful for that. My mother and father, Bob and Lorraine, are watching from home in Alden, Iowa. Um, I think it's closer to 800 people where I'm, where I'm at, Senator Ernst. Uh, my mom was a little uncertain when I shipped off to basic training at 17, but I know my dad was very happy to have me off the payroll. There isn't a military presence in Alden, Iowa, and we weren't from a military family, but there was a Korean War veteran in town that I did some work for while in high school. He told me stories about his time in the Army, and it inspired me to go talk to a recruiter. I came into the Army to get money for college, and I've stayed because of the mission and the people. Over the last almost 250 years, the Army has become one of the greatest ground forces the world has ever seen. We have been the main effort for every conflict in our country's history and have dominated our adversaries because of the courage, imagination, and determination of our soldiers and our nation. Integral to that, if confirmed, I plan to have four focus areas. My number one focus will be on war fighting so that our Army is always ready to respond when our nation calls. Second, I will work to ensure that we are continually improving to stay ahead of our potential adversaries. As the war in Ukraine has shown us, we are in a rapidly changing strategic environment. We can't afford not to evolve. Third, I'll work to ensure that we have the industrial and sustainment base and the soldier and family support infrastructure to rapidly project our force across the globe. Fourth and finally, I'll continue to strengthen the Army profession and build cohesive teams with starts with fixing recruiting so that we remain an Army of the people and for the people, a formidable team of all volunteer warriors. I am proud to be a U.S. Army soldier, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General. I have a series of uh, standard questions which you could respond to. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? Yes, Chairman. Have you assumed any duties or taken any actions that would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? No, Chairman. Exercising our legislative and oversight responsibilities makes it important that this committee, its subcommittees, and other appropriate committees of Congress receive testimony, briefings, reports, records, and other information from the executive branch on a timely basis. Do you agree, if confirmed, to appear and testify before this committee when requested? Yes, Chairman. Do you agree, when asked before this committee, to give your personal views, even if your views differ from the administration? Yes, Chairman. Do you agree to provide records, documents, and electronic communications in a timely manner when requested by this committee, its subcommittees, or other appropriate committees of Congress, and to consult with the requester regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial in providing such records? Yes, I do, Chairman. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established by the Committee for the Production of Reports, Records, and Other Information, including timely responding to hearing questions for the record? Yes, Chairman. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional request? Yes, Chairman. Will those witnesses and briefers be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? Yes, Chairman. Thank you very much, General. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, I think uh, we all share Senator Ernst's uh, enthusiasm and confidence in your uh, assumption is confirmed of the role of Chief of Staff in the Army. And one of the issues that you identified uh, up front was recruiting. And we know there are many forces, as I mentioned in my comments, that are making it difficult, not just for the military, but for, for businesses to recruit. Um, if confirmed, what actions you, would you take to address this recruiting crisis? I, I must say, as I mentioned before, I was very impressed with General Kelly and the Future Soldier Prep Course. And I think also, too, we have to spread our focus not only to high school ROTC, but to junior colleges. But 
Please, sir, your comments. Um, yes, Chairman, it's, uh, as I said in my opening statement, I think it's the number one challenge that we face and the, and the one thing that we have to be focused on, we are. I will tell you that every leader in the Army, and I have been as the vice, is completely focused on this. And there's really two areas. Some of these are, you know, we're doing whatever we can in the short term, and I'll mention a couple of those. Um, we also have a, uh, a longer term, what we've called this basically a sprint that we hope to finish here within this next month of what are, you know, do we need, how do we need to change structurally or what big changes do we need to make? You know, are we, um, how we're picking recruiters, where we have our recruiters at, uh, the command and control structure, marketing, we're reviewing every aspect of that. Um, as you uh, mentioned up front, we are, you know, some of the challenges that we're having is having people to meet our standards. We don't, we are not going to lower our standards. Um, the future soldier prep course has been very helpful to that. Um, we are, you know, down there helping them, um, people that uh, generally otherwise meet the, you know, the standards to get in the military pass our, the ASVAB. We've had challenges. Um, with folks passing um, the entrance test, and that's helping them, um, and then also helping them to uh, um, pass the height and weight so that they get in. We've seen very good success for that, better than 95 percent, and they're doing better um, in basic training. And we, uh, I think the big thing on the, you mentioned on you know, perceptions, um, a lot of people are, there's two big things, I think, that the big perception is putting their life on hold that young, young kids are worried about. I, I can I remember that um, and was basically told, hey, it's going to accelerate your life. And I still use that because it was, because it has. And I think we need to get that word out, and we're working very hard to do that. Um, but that's the big reason that we hear people are you know, not coming in the military. I thought it was uh, interesting you mentioned that uh, the Korean War veteran who got you interested uh, one of the issues is a generational one. We just don't have the volume of veterans we used to have that would talk to young men and women and inspire them. But uh, we have to get this solution solved. One issue uh, I would ask is you've been looking closely at the, the fighting in Ukraine. And what lessons are you uh, drawing from what's going on there at that can must be applicable to the Army? Um, we're, I mean, there's a lot of lessons um, that we're taking from that and something that we are, are studying. I think everybody is, at, is, is studying that. So um, I'll give you a couple broad, uh, very broad ones. First, Chairman, I think that um, uh, partners and allies and just the strength of that, I mean, was something that was, has been immediate. Um, I think how we, you know, the Western forces go about mission command and how we allow initiative and just how impactful that is um, on the battlefield. I could go down every warfighting function that we have. I'll mention uh, a couple in each really quick. I think the importance of long-range fires and the accuracy of that, that is something that the um, Army, really the Joint Force, is investing in and just how important that is. Um, I think people are seeing around the world how great U.S. equipment is. That's another thing that I think everybody is seeing. Um, I th we're learning a lot in logistics and, you know, with 3D printing that's happening that's up there. Um, we used to pull uh, artillery tubes, for example, back to be repaired and maybe all the way back to a depot. That's happening through telemaintenance in a much more forward position. Um, we're learning a lot in counter unmanned systems, so counter UAS and how they've been used. I mean, it's, uh, that is rapidly evolving um, over there. So I think I could go on and on on this one. Well, thank you, sir. And again, I, uh, I thank you for your service, your family's sure. service. Uh, um, back in 1971, um, a dating fellow cadets was not I heard, uh, but uh, times have changed for the better, and the result is before us. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Wicker, please. I'll leave that alone. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of things in my opening statement, General, So, and, and it may be that others will want to delve into this. I, I mentioned the total Army analysis, which is required in last year's um, NDAA, Section 1044, um, you just um, solemnly 
answered uh, one of the standard questions that the chairman always asks. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established by this committee for the production of reports, records, and other information? Uh, do you acknowledge that that, also, that, that includes uh, things like the total Army analysis? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, just, just want to point out, when, when, uh, when something is placed in the statute by the House and Senate and signed by the President, it is the law of the land, and uh, we want to give you what you want to uh, win for our nation, and, uh, and, and we do hope that uh, our general officers will uh, lead by example by giving us in a timely manner what we want. Uh, and uh, in, in, in transitioning to, to what you need, um, talk about what the attackums could do for our friends in Ukraine in winning this war against illegal uh, Russian invasion. Um, the French are now uh, prepared to deliver uh, what, what you call storm shadows or scalps. I'm, I don't know which, what the correct term is that, that we're supposed to use. Um, how helpful would our attackums be to the effort to defeat the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Um, Senator, the, the, the attackums obviously are great. That missile is, uh, is a great system, adds range. Um, so that's basically what it would be um, providing is the ability to, to attack deeper targets. Um, you know, in the end, I think that uh, we have discovered it looking at this and the chairman asked about lessons learned. It's still a combined arms fight. There's a lot of things that go into um, conducting offensive operations and I think that's an aspect of it. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're going to uh, obey the commander in chief, no question about it, and he's going to make the call there. But uh, you also um, have agreed to give us your own personal opinion. The, these attackums would be helpful to the Ukrainians who have asked for them. Is that not correct? I, I, yes. And, uh, and in terms of the range of them, if that's a problem, uh, actually the range of the French weapons being um, uh, provided to Ukrainians is, is uh, greater range. Is that not correct? Um, I, I'm not familiar with exactly what the range is on the on the French weapon. Okay, we'll just su uh, supply that on the record, and that'll be fine. Let me ask you about uh, about a favorite of mine, and that is Junior ROTC. You're you are a uh, graduate of the academy, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, I got my commission through ROTC at the University of Mississippi, but um, it has uh, become clearer and clearer how important. The, the ROTC at the high schools is. If you ask a principal of a high school, you ask a superintendent of a public school system if they would like to have uh, junior ROTC of some kind, whether it's Army or, or whatever, they will, that, they've always given me a resounding yes. And the, uh, the RAND Corporation, other independent uh, studies have uh, confirmed that Junior ROTC in high schools is a citizenship builder, and only 10% of our high schools are able to have junior ROTC, but 40% of our recruits come We're increasing the floor of junior ROTC in the NDAA and, uh, and, and raising the ceiling. Uh, what is your opinion about this, and will you help us make junior ROTC a success pursuant to this NDAA? Um, <clears throat> Senator, I agree with you completely. Um, I was going to say the exact same thing, where you've had JROTC in a school. We see whether they're part of the program or not, they get exposure to the military, and we have increased you know, people that are joining the military. So um, that's good, and I think they're great programs. And what we're, yes, committed to um, continuing to grow these programs, um, what we want to do is responsibly grow them, make sure that we're picking the right people and working with the local schools um, to do that. But I agree with you. And we're looking to, we have to look at, make sure that we're, there are some areas where we're not, that we could, you know, expand in some of these areas, and, and we're looking at all of that. Right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, in general, there, there are whole sections of the country uh, where th there is really a paucity of junior ROTC. 
This is a citizenship builder, and whether they go into the military or not, it's a subset of schools that are overachievers, that, that attend school more regularly, that graduate more regularly, and, and go on to uh, higher education later. So thank you for that assurance, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Worker. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before beginning my questions, I can't help but comment on the futility of this hearing, since we know that General George will not be confirmed in any time in the foreseeable future, not because of his qualifications or his experience or his vast knowledge that he would bring to the job, but because of a hold that's been held on all general officers. Uh, general George, you've committed to giving us your best professional advice. Uh, do you believe that this bl blanket hold on the promotion of general officers, which has left us, for example, without a commandant of the Marine Corps in the first time in over 100 years, is uh, undermining national security? Um, Senator, it is, yes, it is impacting um, our readiness. Um, for us, it's important as we move leaders to get the right leader in the right place at the right time, and especially with the, with the right experience. And so that's, that's what we're challenged with right now with the whole. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I have to take a point of personal privilege here, if I might, and, and I'll be brief. Um, I'm, I'm um, mindful of, of the senator from Maine's point of view, but as a matter of fact, a, a nominee for um, chief of staff of the Army can be brought to the floor in the usual manner, despite a hold, by the majority leader, taken up for a vote, cloture voted, and the confirmation uh, proceed. Is that not correct, Mr. Chairman? Uh, that is correct, but that does not account for the 250 and 60 uh, general officers. It, indeed, it, it's, it's, and a the general, it's a general statement uh, that applies to the others. But with regard to this nominee and the one yesterday, they'll be taken up in, in the normal course when the majority leader decides to bring them to the floor, and I uh, think that will happen expeditiously. Thank you, sir. Well, my yeah. response would be that national security is being compromised by all 250 of those nominees that are being held up, not just by one or two. I'd like to proceed with my questions, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Uh, continue. Uh, uh, General, you have two hats, if, if when confirmed. Uh, one is best military advice to the President of the United States. The other is Chief of Staff of the Army. The press. One of the hardest things to do is saying something that's difficult to the boss. Are you willing to give the President of the United States advice that he or she doesn't want to hear? And it's, uh, we still haven't solved the problem. Yes, I am, Senator. I think we've had, I've had to give um, advice to my boss um, as I've, you know, advanced in my career. I've had to do that. And, and I hope that that's, that's something that you will remember as you undertake this position because it's, 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 if you look back through history, even recent history, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, telling the boss what they wanted to hear got us into some real serious trouble. So I hope you'll remember this moment and take that responsibility very, very seriously. Um, you mentioned uh, the nature of war, and the quote you used was rapidly changing strategic environment. Could you expand on that a bit and tell me what you mean by that and how you believe we have to evolve to meet those new challenges? Um, Senator, I'll use uh, what in the unmanned systems as an example and, and loitering munitions and what we've seen because I think there's been a lot of that that's been out there in the open source press, but just how quickly things are, you know, you can take something off the shelf, for example, and weaponize it or add different components to it. There's 3D printing that can go to that and can rapidly change. And so what that's caused also for us is that you have to think about how do you defend yourself against that. So I think we have to look at it both on the offensive and on the defensive side. I think what we've seen with, uh, as well on the, with software and just how quickly you can change and advance capabilities, that that, that is happening. And, and you can really look at that across all the other warfighting functions as well, cyber. Speed is one of the things you're focusing on. I'm delighted to hear you talk about 3D printing because 
we can't afford to be, as you say, sending something back to the depot. In my view, every barrack, every barracks, every hangar, every ship should have a 3D printer, and we should be buying the intellectual property when we buy a platform. Do you agree? Yes, Senator, I agree. Um, uh, very, very quickly in some time that I have left, lessons from Ukraine. What have we learned uh, about what's going on in Ukraine and how that war has proceeded in terms of tactics, strategy, uh, weaponry, uh, some quick thoughts on lessons from Ukraine? Um, I'll try to give a couple uh, in addition to what I talked about before because I could go on. We're studying this. We're learning a lot um, from this. Um, you know, just what's going on right now, I think we're learning how difficult uh, offensive operations are and what you have to, you know, piece together um, to do. I think that's the same for, uh, didn't cover a lot earlier on integrated air and missile defense, um, but it gets to the counter UAS piece that I brought up before that you were going to have to have um, systems that are able to, you know, knock down um, and you first you got to see all of that, but then you got to be able to knock down um, small, you know, class one, two, three um, unmanned systems all the way up to cruise missiles. Um, we're learning over there. And I think Ukraine's doing a great job. I, the, the basic thing um, that I think we've learned from the beginning is it's critical to have the will to fight, and that is exactly what the Ukrainians have been showing us over there. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General George, first of all, I want to thank you for your service to our country and to your family. Uh, and Patty, thank you, because when you deploy, your entire family really deploys. There's a separation that does not go away. Uh, movements that a lot of the rest of the country don't take into account from one location to another as your different missions are assigned. And I want to say thank you to not just you, but your family as well for that. Um, I'd like to begin, General, with a, a discussion um, that I've asked all of the other service chiefs about. Um, all of the other service chiefs and the combatant commanders have expressed concerns about the impact auctioning off portions of the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz band of the spectrum would have on our defensive capabilities. Based on what we've discussed before, if this report, which is due in September, demonstrates that auctioning the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz portion of the spectrum will adversely impact our national security, what would be your advice to the President and Congress? Um, Senator, uh, my advice would be we need that spectrum, and um, if if we were going to lose that, obviously it would be time and resources um, to be able to adjust to that capability. We are taking part in that study right now and, and uh, providing our insights to that. Thank you. I, I think one part that's missing sometimes is, is that certain parts of the spectrum have, to one degree or another, the necessary physics that allow for some real capabilities, and that's the reason why some of our systems have been established in that area to begin with. Would you concur with that? I would concur with that. Thank you, sir. Um, General, there's time here. It looks like right now there's perhaps a 90,000 personnel shortfall between the numbers within the Army and the numbers that we're projected to need. Um, you're going to take your position at a time in, in which this recruiting crisis is probably the most severe that it's been since uh, DOD's 50-year all-volunteer force was created in the first place. While the Army struggles to meet recruiting numbers, many have criticized what is viewed as an increased and an untoward emphasis on immutable characteristics like race and sex throughout the DOD. And the department has increasingly focused on new policies and plans in areas like equity, extremism, gender ideology, abortion, and sex change operations. There is even a growing bureaucracy focusing on these specific issues. I know that when you started, there was a concern about this may set us back a few years or it delays your movement into other activities and so forth. That was the way it was then, and that still is one of the concerns as you've expressed earlier. That did not stop us from meeting our recruitment goals 
20 years ago, and it, I, while it may impact some today, I think there are other things that may have an impact as well, including the, the items that I've just discussed. I guess my perspective is that everyone should be welcome to serve if qualified, but we are losing focus on teamwork, discipline, uh, and the enormous challenge presented by an emergent China. How do you see this issue, sir? And is this an area where when we start talking about all of these other items, are they impacting our ability to recruit young men and women? Um, Senator, I, I would say yes. And, you know, perceptions. Um, the, the first thing you mentioned, I mean, we yes, we have to turn recruiting around, and I'm confident, and we're going to put the whole Army's effort and all the leaders behind it to do that, and we appreciate your, any help that you're providing with that. Um, we are keeping soldiers in the Army, so retention is at near historic, so they like the units that they're serving in. Um, I will tell you that I spend most of my time, um, we focus on war fighting, and that's been my... That's been my experience. Um, we do talk about building cohesive teams. That's been my, also been my experience since I was first in. There are things that you have to do to make sure that you're bringing everybody together um, from across the country and everybody has the same values and you know character as part of that that's, that's critically important to us. So I do, I think any time that there's a perception of something from somebody because it's like I mentioned up front, um, it was a veteran that talked to me. It's coaches that talk to people and teachers. And I, I mean, I would want people to know that the, the Army is a great place to be. Um, it's a life accelerator. And, you know, we're focused on our mission. And there's so many things that you can do in the military um, to advance your life. And we got to get the word out on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and General George, great to meet with you yesterday. I look forward to supporting your nomination. Um, I'll, I'll add to the recruiting challenge. You could hardly send a worse message to people who are thinking about joining the military and maybe making a career out of it than is being sent right now with these military holds. Uh, one of my kids is a Marine officer, eight years active, now a reservist. Um, like everybody else who joins an all-voluntary military willing to risk their life for their country. But why would they sign up to serve knowing that a member of the United States Senate could block their professional advancement because they're disappointed with a policy that they had nothing to do with? And that's what's happening right now. 250 people, soon to be more than 600, who have volunteered to wear the uniform of the country and risk their life to defend the country are being blocked from professional advancement because a member of this body is disappointed with a policy that these hundreds had nothing to do with. If you're disappointed with a policy in the military, especially if you're a member of this committee, you have an opportunity every year when we mark up a defense bill to try to convince your colleagues that the policy should be changed. I've been now through 11 NDAAs on this committee, and every year I introduce amendments and try to convince my colleagues that my position is right, and sometimes I prevail, but I often don't. And if I can't convince my colleagues I'm right, that's on me. But I don't take it out on hundreds of officers and their families whose lives are being put in limbo because I'm unhappy. This is, I, I associate myself with Senator King's points. This is hurting our defense. This is hurting our nation when we are in a very challenging global environment. And as we're talking about what we can do to try to make military service more attractive, it's sending exactly the wrong message to people that we are trying to encourage to join the military. General George, you, uh, I think you were aware we had a hearing earlier this year where Army experts came and talked about the recruiting challenge. And they listed the reasons that through some intense surveying why recruiting is tough. And the number one reason is I'm worrying that I'm putting my life on hold, that others will move ahead and I will not because I'll be in a situation where I can't advance. That was even a more powerful factor than I'm worrying about the risk of my life. People 
were able to accept that risk and still wanted to join. But the number one factor that people weren't joining is, gosh, I'm worried that if I join the military, I'm going to have to put my life on hold and I won't be able to advance like others. This body is sending a loud message that is being heard all over this country to people who have risen through the ranks, who have served, who have deployed multiple times, whose families have moved, who've sacrificed. We're sending a loud message to them that, wow, Cain's mad about something that the Pentagon is doing, and he couldn't convince his, his colleagues that it was right. So what, I should just punish everybody who had nothing to do with it? I pray that we will turn from this dangerous path, because if one senator can do this, hey, all 100 will find something at the Pentagon that they're not wild about, and suddenly it's okay. Well, look, I'm not happy, and I couldn't convince my colleagues, but I at least can punish people who are blameless. I hope we'll turn from this. General, I want to ask you about the Radford Depot. My, my team and I recently went to the Radford Army Ammunition Plant. We heard about the challenges that they face competing for contracts. Radford's a strategic capability, critical component in our nation's mission to produce munitions, which is important and getting more important. Although cost is an important consideration in these items, we also need to preserve the viability of organic industrial base. I, I know you've spent time focusing upon the munitions production needs of the country. So how do you view the balance between choosing vendors with lowest cost bids while maintaining the ability to deliver readiness from our organic industrial base? Um, as, as you mentioned, um, Senator uh, Radford and several other depots out there are critically important. And it's an amazing workforce, having been to a bunch of them and what they do and just how patri patriotic they are in their mission. Um, I think what we are looking at doing, and we have spent some of our own money to try to, we need to inside the budget. Um, we appreciate the support we've gotten from Congress. I think we got $1.6 billion last year um, to also invest in that. Um, I, we do have to upgrade these depots. I think that it's, it's important to do that um, and do it in a way where we can increase production. I, get, I can give one example of an ammunition plant where you can build the capability, you can keep the same size workforce, and then have the ability to expand uh, production from there. And I think that's you know where we need to focus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you uh, very much, General George, for your time today. Patty, thank you for being here, and to the rest of the family. And I want to send a special thank you um, also to your parents back home in Iowa. And I know that they uh, are very, very proud of your accomplishments, General George. Um, I also know that uh, when you are confirmed, you will be an effective steward for the Army and a great partner to those of us on this committee. So I do want to express um, some of the concerns that I have, and, and we have discussed our special operations forces in detail, um, but uh, just for everyone's knowledge and information uh, with the recruiting challenges the army is uh, expressing interest in in cutting our soft forces soft was born for great power competition they are the nation's purpose-built force for campaigning against great powers their value proposition is to deter war in peacetime and create military advantages for the joint force in wartime but SOF also remains the nation's premier force for crisis response and counterterrorism. As a recent congressionally mandated study determined, the demand signal from theater commanders for SOF will increase. I am concerned uh, to learn of the proposals to cut Army SOF by 10 to 20 percent. Now, I know we are facing budgetary challenges. Uh, the end strength challenges also are squeezing the whole Army. Uh, but soft or not. Army is actually looking for. And worse, those cuts could have disproportionate impact on special operations missions. So the numbers aren't adding up at this time. We're looking to cut soft when we need them the most. Um, so, General, do you believe these reductions would limit the Army's ability to provide forces to commanders? to deter great powers, counterterrorism, and respond to crises? 
Um, Senator, uh, I've been deploying side by side with soft forces for the, in the last 20 years. Um, agree, agree with you that they're an amazing um, capability. They have been and they will continue to be. I agree with that. What we're doing with modeling, and I've been ta talking with both General Braga, who is a USASOC mm -hmm. commander. Um, the Army makes up about 65 to 70 percent of all of SOCOM. Mm -hmm. And what we do is model to see, you know, how are things going to be different? What capabilities do we need? So when I was in Afghanistan um, just a couple of years ago, there was 11,000 that was there. Most of that was soft, mm -hmm. and we're not doing that. So mm -hmm. I think we have to review all of this. We are in the process. There's been no decisions made. Um, I'm close to both of them. I actually heard from uh, General Fenton this morning. Very good. Um, so we're talking through that, but I think what we owe you is the best joint force and military that can tackle the problems that are ahead, and that's what we're working on. Yes, and so uh, just to make clear, you will be uh, working with those commanders, those operational commanders, and making sure that the cuts wouldn't create operational risk, and uh, you can report those to Congress. Is is that yes, correct? Yes, Senator, we're working closely with them, absolutely. Okay, and I, I do hope that as you're working through those issues, then uh, before any of those cuts are approved, that you would notify uh, members of this committee. And I think just earlier, because Senator Wicker, of course, we're going to come over before any of these, you know, final, you know, this comes out, that we will talk it over with you first. No, good. Thank you. And General, um, I do want to share SOCOM's assessment. Uh, we did receive this uh, just recently, and it says that SOF can only execute its assigned mission with SOF enablers, and cutting enablers increases risk to mission. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to, uh, if I would ask if we could enter this into uh, the record. Without and objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, General. SOF, it, um, they are a strategic capability uh, for the Joint Force, and I look forward to working with you to strengthen them. I will follow up with additional questions for the record, but again, General George, you have my full support with your nomination and confirmation. Um, I'm proud to be uh, sharing the, the desk with you this morning for the introduction, and again, congratulations to your family. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Senator. Chair. Thank you, Senator All right, Senator Rosen, please. Thank you, Chairman Reed. appreciate you for holding this hearing. And I want to thank you, too, General George, for testifying today, for your lifelong service, your thoughtfulness. And, of course, we would always be remiss if we didn't think about the families who pack and unpack, do all of that, uh, I guess, schlepping around the world uh, in order to support um, the service to our nation. So I thank you and your family. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, small arms range for Nevada, and so I want to revisit an issue that I've consistently raised with General McConville and Secretary Warmoth. Currently, Nevada's Guard and Reserve soldiers are traveling to surrounding states in order to satisfy their annual weapons qualification. It's an average cost of $500,000, half a million dollars per year per unit. I'm appreciative of the Army's commitment to Correct this, which spurred the effort underway to build a permanent range at Hawthorne Army Depot by FY25. It's my understanding that Nevada Army National Guard is on track to complete their planning and design to meet that timeline. So General George, if confirmed, can I have your commitment that a small arms qualification range is built in FY25 so that Nevada soldiers can meet their annual requirements at greater convenience and lower cost to the taxpayer? Yes, Senator. Thank you. I'll take that as a strong yes. It's strong yes. Well, it, everybody is very excited to do that. Nevada will really improve our readiness. And we're going to stay with Hawthorne Army Depot because um, we are the largest uh, ammunition depot and demilitarization facility. And so despite its size and crucial role that Hawthorne Army Depot plays for our munitions readiness, it is in desperate need of significant infrastructure upgrades, such as replacing boilers that have, were installed in 1974, nearly 50 years ago. They're now inoperable. We need to modernize condemned buildings that are unable to be occupied and fixing roads that are currently impassable. 
And so I'm proud that this committee adopted my report language during the NDAA markup that encourages the Secretary of the Army to prioritize infrastructure investments for Hawthorne and requires the Army to brief us on the status to upgrade and repair the infrastructure and functionality of um, the depot. And so the need to invest in our munitions depots, it's only become more acute in light of the need to ramp up munitions production, not only to arm Ukraine, but also to backfill our own stockpiles. So during this year's Army posture hearing, Secretary Warmoth made a commitment to me to take a look at investments at Hawthorne. So General George, again, have confirmed, can I have your commitment to include Hawthorne in the Army's next future year's defense planning or even unfunded priority list so that Congress can fund these investments to ensure our munitions readiness? This is top of mind. Um, yes, Senator. We're, I mean, we, we are reviewing that. We do have a plan across all of that, and obviously we have to balance um, readiness exercises and everything else to look at that. But yes, it's critically important for us, um, and we will definitely take a close look at, at Hawthorne, really, and across our industrial base. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I, I want to talk a little bit now about remote maintenance support that we're uh, giving to Ukraine. And so we know that the Army is providing remote maintenance teams to allow Ukrainians on the front lines to receive immediate advice, hands-on advice from U.S. soldiers and contractors on weapons and equipment, equipment maintenance. So as Ukraine receives more advanced equipment, the demand for these teams is frankly going to grow. And so, General George, what should the Army be doing to expand this program to ensure it's equipped to efficiently and accurately respond to requests out in an active battlefield, like in Ukraine, um, as particularly as their counteroffensive um, continues to evolve? Well, Senator, as uh, we, earlier we were talking about lessons, I think that's one of the big lessons that we've learned, what you can do with telemaintenance and what that does to reduce have to backhaul things and what you can fix forward. Um, so I'm, I'm re we're really proud of what uh, Army Material Command and, and U.S. Army Europe is doing to put this forward across all of these equipments. And, and we'll absolutely, we pay close attention to operational readiness rates and we'll continue to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Scott, please. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, General George. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your family for being here. Thank you for your service. Um, so can we talk about recruiting? Um, let me just give you some numbers that you probably already know. I guess um, the Army law missed their numbers by 25% last year, and, and I think it's on track to do 23% uh, less this year. There's a Pentagon study that showed 77% of American youth are not eligible uh, to serve. And there's a recent Wall Street Journal article that highlighted a disturbing trend that said children of military families who typically make up 80% of Army recruits are telling their children not to serve, especially those in the South. So I'll just give you the, the things I'll ask, and you can answer me in any order. One, can, can you talk about the, what you're going to do, if anything, on the people that were discharged on COVID? So if you can talk about that. And then what would you, if you, were out, if you got to talk to all these military families about why their, their kids should serve, what would you say to them? Um, and what would you tell if you were talking to, like, I, I think I was, I was telling somebody on your team, I've got an 11 year old grandson who I'm sure is going to serve in the military. Why should he serve in the Army? If you're into, what would you tell these kids of why they should go in uh, to the Army? Um, can you talk about what you're doing at Fort Jackson, where you're trying to pre prepare kids uh, for, uh, for joining the military that might not be able to get in? And then, is there anything Congress ought to be doing to help you? And there's no, however, whatever order you want to do it. Okay, um, thanks, Senator. Um, first, on, on COVID discharges, we do have a, a process. There have been people that have come back into the Army um, that were discharged for COVID, and you know, specifically for COVID, it wasn't um, COVID and several other things that kind of went along with that. So I'm confident that we have a process, that, and we have had people that come back in. Um, you think it's going to work? You What's think that? a lot of people? You think a lot of people will come back? Well, I, that will be obviously up to them. We want anybody who's able-bodied and you know wants to come back and, and serve their country um, to come back in and join us. Um, your second question was, uh, you know, talking to to families. Does that surprise out there. you? Does that number surprise you about military families telling their kids they don't they shouldn't come back in? Or they um, I don't know where you got the statistic um, at. 
I'll find it. Senator, but I, I would, uh, what I was going to tell you is, um, and I just had a friend who just sent his, uh, his son, just did a year of college, and now he's enlisted and he's going to the Rangers, so I'm, which I'm very happy about. Um, so I think there's a lot of them out there that are still telling their kids and they know. I think what we got to do is change the perception and talk to them about what we're doing. And the one thing I would tell you, and I think we've had a couple of conversations, we got to get out and get that story out to people um, that are influencers and talk to our veterans and tell them what we're focusing on. Again, retention has not been a problem for us. People are staying in the military. Um, we're very busy. We're deploying. We're doing things. Um, so uh, why the Army? And um, obviously, I love the Army. been doing this for a really long time. But I know you can do almost anything in the Army. Um, and I think it's proven to be uh, a meritocracy. You work hard, um, do your job. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna advance. And there's a million different things you can do from cyber. You know, everybody doesn't have to be an infantryman or artillery. There's a lot of things that you can do in the military. And I tell everybody that um, I did not plan. I came in for a couple of years. I mainly stayed for the people initially, and obviously I love the mission. So, and I think we got to get that word out and and talk to people. Um, I'm really proud of, to your last question on Fort Jackson, um, what we're doing down there with the Future Soldier Prep Course. And it gets to your, you said 77% can't meet the standards. We have had, we've seen, you know, some of the, that's dropped actually um, from just a couple of years ago. Um, we want people to meet our standard, and I think we want them to know that, that we're willing to invest in them and help them pass that test, get healthier. Um, I'd love, for, if, if you haven't been down there, I think it's good, and I'm always amazed when I, the number one story I always hear is everybody says, I'm glad I put my phone up a little bit, and I'm sleeping better, I'm doing better, but I think uh, it's helping, that course is helping, and we're seeing great results out of it. Can you, uh, thank you. Can you just talk, um, we don't have much time left, but just talk about the troops we have in, in Asia and the importance of them and, um, and are they really doing their job? Are they going to help detour either China, North Korea, or any bad actor? Um, I, absolutely. I think, Senator, we got, uh, and um, you, Sir Pack, is doing a lot. Would like to come sit down and talk to you about that or have somebody can explain what what the army is out there doing in the Pacific. And like we talked about with Ukraine, I think part, you know, partnerships, partners and allies mean a lot. And you do, human interoperability, I think is the most important thing. You get that out of exercises that we're doing over there. Um, and we're doing a lot of them. Um, I was, uh, it, it's amazing the, the relationships that we built, I think in, in Europe, and we're doing the same thing in, uh, in the Pacific theater. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Warren, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you here, General George. Welcome. Congratulations. So I am deeply concerned about the increasing number of suicides that we're seeing among active duty soldiers. In the first quarter of 2023, 49 active duty soldiers took their own lives. That is the highest first quarter number since DOD first started collecting these data a decade ago. Now, the Army has studied this problem a lot, but it hasn't acted with enough urgency. From 2019 to 2022, the Army sponsored 47 studies addressing suicide. However, an Army audit obtained by the Project on Government Oversight found that nearly 90% of those studies, quote, didn't have any actionable recommendations or recommended only more research. Nearly 90% of them. And for the few studies that did have actionable recommendations, the Army did nothing. Now, the Army was originally supposed to issue new suicide prevention regulations in the fall of 2021. Nearly two years after that deadline, it has still failed to do so, and our service members are suffering. So, General George, if you are confirmed, can I count on you to help get these regs out, and even more importantly, to help get these regs implemented in order to address the suicide crisis in our military? Um, yes, Senator. 
Good. Can, can I talk? Can I say a you couple sure things can. about that? You sure can. Um, be, just in my experience, because uh, as a commander, it wasn't necessarily the regulation. Fair enough. That made the difference for me. It was you know getting the resources and then command emphasis, and that's what we have to do. And right now we're um, um, doing what we call a building cohesive teams update. Um, and I always talk about every location's a little bit different. And I always give you know the example of Alaska versus Fort Irwin versus now Fort Liberty. Very different, they're facing different challenges. And I think that that's what we're trying to do is focus. One of the things that, hap that we've learned from, we'll, we'll take things that work, um, but in, in Alaska they're doing something called Mission 100, which is basically getting somebody to talk to a counselor immediately. Everybody has to do that within the year. Because um, what we're finding is a lot of these problems aren't necessarily you know, behavioral health problems. They're relationship issues, um, financial issues. I think we got to look at this um, through health and holistic fitness. Um, our health and holistic fitness, um, where we've fielded that in the brigades, um, we have seen you know, reductions in behavioral health and in suicides. And so again, I think it's that's what we have to focus on are, are the end results, and we're we're not happy with where we're at. Well, right and and I appreciate the attention that you have paid to this, and I have every confidence you will continue to do this. But I just want to be able to say quite publicly, you and I, this has got to be a priority for the Army, and seeing these first quarter numbers is truly alarming. You know, one other thing that we know, uh, you raised several factors can contribute to suicide. Another one we know is failure to respond to sexual harassment or assault. So General George, do you agree that addressing sexual assault and harassment should be part of the solution to suicide prevention programs at DOD? Um, Senator, I think all of that is yes, is, is a part of that if you're having them. And so first it's prevention of those kind of things that we have to focus on. And then in the response, absolutely making sure that we're taking care of the victim. I appreciate that. You know, we don't have suicide prevention regulations yet, but we do have recommendations from what's called the Suicide Prevention and Response Independent Review Committee. And one of the shortfalls it identified in a report earlier this year is the critical shortage of behavioral health professionals. Do you agree that one tool in addressing these shortages could involve the Army working with service members to facilitate access to whatever care can help them, whether it's directly through DOD or outside DOD? Um, yes, Senator, I, I agree with that. And like I said before, I think what we're trying to do is, if it's specifically, I think there's a national shortage in behavioral health specialists. So what we want to do is make sure that we're triaging and you know people who need the behavioral health right. Actually, get that, and Good. if somebody has a financial issue or relationship right. issue, they're talking to somebody. I, I appreciate that. I just want to mention that in Massachusetts, we have the home base program, which is making a big difference to service members and their families. They provide treatment for post traumatic stress disorder and depression, as well as for the complicated grief of loved ones who have lost a service member or a veteran. Uh, to suicide, and it provides an opportunity for service members to get the help they need without worrying about the stigma of seeking help through DOD instead. So I want us to do everything we can in this area, and I look forward to having a chance to work with you. Thank you, General George. Thank you, Senator. I look forward to getting up to see home base. And Good. Native I'm going to hold you there. Yes, Senator. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Tobriel, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, thanks for being here. You and your family, thanks for your service. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, we want to try to keep politics out of, uh, out of your business. You don't need that, and I apologize for what you've had to go through this morning. Some of your hearing time shouldn't, shouldn't, you shouldn't have gone through that, but because you can't control that. Okay, so, but I thank you for being here. Uh, but you're going to find out in your recruiting, we've talked about recruiting today, your three biggest hurdles are going to be politicians, the media, and social media. That's going to be your three biggest problems. Uh, I've gone through that before, not in the military, but also in coaching. And so uh, that's some things that you're going to have to fight through. I, just one little story. About a year ago, I'll tell you a sad story. I, one of the big things that we get here uh, that you get 
um, satisfaction from is to be able to nominate young men and women to the military academies, which is awesome. I mean, it's an awesome accomplishment. Uh, uh, they work for it all their life. They put their heart and soul into it. And I called a young man last year in Alabama, and it had been his lifelong goal. He perfect in every score and in school. And he said, Coach, I'm going to turn it down. I've read too much in the media about what's going on. I don't want any part of it. That's the direction that we're headed in this country. We need kids like him to be in the military, not force them out because of too much dang politics. So uh, good luck to you, uh, and I think you're going to do a, a, an awesome job. I want to ask you about uh, the future long-range assault aircraft, the new helicopter that we're getting ready to start, and you're going to be the recipient of that. Uh, what's your thoughts about it? You know, the decision that we made, you know, with the uh, dual rotor. Uh, you're talking uh, Flora? Yeah, uh, Flora. Yeah. I, well, I think that uh, that helicopter, obviously, the, the ones that we've had and I've been, you know, on for the last 20 years are great. This one, you're going to get double the speed and double the range um and have the ability to upgrade them from them i think that that will be a significant improvement and as i mentioned up front um, we have to constantly be looking to evolve and i think that this will help us definitely help us to do that you think that's going to help us in the indo-pacific you know the army being involved if there happens to be a future conflict i, I do yes senator because of the size the speed i think the size and the speed and getting and moving things around Yes, Senator. Thank you. You know, tomorrow, you know, I'll be meeting with General Hamilton, you know, the commander of the Army Material Command. As you know, Anniston Depot is the designated center of industrial and technology excellence for vehicles such as the M1 Abram tank and the Stryker. Uh, the depot has teammates deployed around the world in direct support of our nation's war fighters, providing service and repairs in the field, especially in this time of, of, of the conflict we're having in Europe. Uh, General, what's being done to ensure that the depots around the country can meet the current forecasted workload to replenish what we're losing now? Um, Senator, first, uh, as I mentioned to you, I think uh, we're super proud of Anniston. A lot of what ends up in, in Ukraine has been touched by the great workforce that's, uh, that's down there at Anniston and also helping with all of the logistics is also coming out of, uh, of Redstone. Um, we are in the process of updating the industrial base. It, it's critically important to the Army, really to the Joint Force and to our nation. Um, we have a long-range plan to do that, and we've kind of broken it up in interim increments to prioritize what we can do. Um, we had spent uh, a good amount, $1.5 billion out of our budget. Thanks to Congress, we got an additional uh, $1.6 billion. And I think, you know, we're continuing to look at, at that and what we need to do to pull it left. It's oftentimes not as easy as just going out and fixing everything all at once because we also have to continue to do what we're doing at Anniston. So you have to figure out how you're upgrading it while continuing the mission. You know, I'm amazed at how many people it takes to run a tank, not the people inside, but the people that follow along, the, the fuel, the, the maintenance, mechanics. Yes, I mean, yeah. it is... It, it, it is unbelievable just just looking through that scenario. But uh, again, congratulations Thank to you, you your family, and look forward to going to Redstone and Fort Novacell and uh, Anniston in the near future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Tuberville. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good to see you again, General. And uh, very nice meeting your family. And congratulations on your nomination. And I really appreciate the conversation we had. I think it was about a month ago about the importance of leveraging existing Army assets to strengthen our electronic warfare capabilities and uh, hearing your perspective on how critical our Army's training ranges are uh, to that work and that effort. Uh, the Fort Huachuca Electronic Proving Ground offers great potential for electronic warfare testing, experimentation, and training. And Fort Huachuca, as we discussed, has a truly unique geography that allows us to safely employ um, electronic warfare effects and to train very realistically. And a DOD team recently came out to the fort and assessed their capability and found that it does have the capacity 
and the expertise and the will also to do more. And in my view, we need to seize this opportunity. That's why I led a provision in this year's defense bill requiring that the Secretary of Defense carry out a demonstration of a new Western Range complex. This will eventually serve as a joint, multi-domain, non-kinetic testing and training environment across military departments. And, and the Western Range Complex would connect multiple non-kinetic ranges and training sites to better replicate some real-world threat conditions. And I also worked on provisions to require assessments on where we may need to invest to ensure that we keep pace with changing technology and threats. So General George, if confirmed, you would oversee the execution of Army policies and programs on electronic warfare. So could you explain a little bit why this capability is so important as we accelerate modernization to meet threats posed by countries like Russia and China? Um, yes, Senator. We This kind of gets to some of the earlier questions. We were talking about what have we learned. Um, and uh, a lot in electronic uh, warfare and also in signals intelligence, that's a big part of what we can do out in Huachuca. There's very few locations like what we have, the capability that we have out at um, Huachuca, that, which is also our, the Army's Intel Center. Um, and we have to immediately adapt the kind of lessons that we're learning, and we need places where we can do that. And um, we're looking at places just like you're talking about doing that at Huachuca. Um, also have to integrate that into our combat training centers. So I think it's absolutely, if we're going to evolve, we're going to have to learn how to adapt to those environments. And, and one of the things that makes uh, Fort Huachuca unique is the geography. And when you put an emitter out on the Barry Goldwater Range on the ground to emulate uh, some Chinese threat, um, compared to what you can do in Fort Huachuca, you're talking about upwards of 10 times the power. And what that enables is, uh, you know, say it's a surface-to-air missile threat, you know, a fighter uh, to be able to uh, identify that threat from a much greater distance. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the context of, of what this means for a future uh, conflict in the Pacific if, if we were to get into one? Well, I think that... Uh it's what you're talking about being able to do is realistic training um, that we have to be able to do. That's the, those are the kind of threats that we're going to face, and you have to train. Um, you have to train for that. Uh, we're doing the same thing and trying to incorporate that as where we can um, with our exercises. Some of our exercises have actually linked back to capabilities that we've had at the electronic proving grounds. So I think we have to. Obviously, the Pacific is the expanse and doing geography and linking all of these capabilities to include command and control is something that we'll, we'll continue to do. But it's obviously critically important to the Army and I think the Joint Force. Well, thank you, General. Um, in my remaining time here, I just want to talk about a visit I had at the Army Futures Command, and I was briefed on their efforts to ensure that the U.S. Army remains at the forefront of uh, technological innovation and warfighting capability. And they had some concerns um, that they didn't have a lot of like nimble funding tools and sources, um, and they were often at risk of missing some opportunities to leverage uh, innovation from industry because they didn't have the funding tools available to get uh, resources to companies um, without it taking, in some cases, a couple years. So. Um, I know I'm running out of time here, but General, I'm interested in, in getting some help and a commitment to facilitate some collaboration between the Army Futures Command and the Office of Strategic Capital um, and to see if you would be willing to work with me on these efforts to bridge what we often refer to as the valley of death in government contracting. Um, absolutely, Senator. Whatever we can do to, I think, do things evolve quickly. Um, we're absolutely interested in that, and I'm happy to come see you and talk to you about that more. Thank you, General. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Budd, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, General, for being here, and congrats on your nomination. Um, I want to focus, focus on special operations force structure and potential cuts that have now been widely reported, uh, including an exclusive by Secretary of the Army with the Army Times. 
Special operations forces play a critical role in strategic competition, counterterrorism, and crisis response. So, in general, a, a true or false question here. So, given these requirements, uh, would you say that demand for special operations forces from the combatant commands is growing? Uh, true or false, please. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that specifically, but if you were to ask me uh, how much it's since what we were doing 10 years ago, um, I think, again, what we're trying to do to look at this, and there's been no decisions made on this, on anything with the force structure, um, but we are doing things differently, and it, it, this really comes down to if we're operating in the same theater together and doing the same thing, and that's what we model, um, there are ways that we can do things, I think, one, more efficiently, and two, that would be better for the, for the joint force. So we have a lot of capabilities that are out there already campaigning, um, and I think that we can do a lot of things together. Senator. General, thank you. I appreciate your responses earlier to Senator Ernst and um, her kind introduction of you. Um, the trend that I'm seeing, and this is anecdotal, and we probably would have the data that we're seeing an increased demand on this, but the joint concept for competing states that the joint force will conduct irregular warfare operations and activities proactively to subvert, create dilemmas for adversaries, and impose costs on adversar adversaries' strategic interests. So when I think of irregular warfare, I think specifically about Army SOF, Green Berets, psychological operations, civil affairs. Uh, so another true or false, decreasing the overall, and this is again decreasing overall capacity of Army special operations will decrease joint force ability to conduct the irregular warfare called for by the joint concept for competing. Would that be true or false? I, I'm sorry, I've not given you a true or false, Senator, but I do think that, uh, first of all, for SOF, it takes a long time to grow that capability. We have not, you know, any talked to anybody at SOCOM about specifically, you know, for SOF, that specific capability, because I agree with you, we need that capability and, and out there. I think what we're talking about is how we support that capability that they have. Thank you, General. And in keeping with that, it would seem that if we did decrease SOF in the joint force, that would decrease our ability to compete. Uh, so what is the operational uh, and personnel tempo look like for Army Special Operations? Um, I would tell you that uh, the, the op tempo is, is high really across the Army for what we're doing. So that's kind of how what we measure it as far as um, we're looking at brigade combat teams, the same enablers that we're talking about are over there forward. Um, for example, in, in Europe right now, it's all the Army enablers that are already over there that are supporting the SOF, so they wouldn't have to send additional folks over there. So um, that's what we try to do, to do economies of scale. That's what you would expect us to do, um, because we also need an Army that can fight and win. Um, and so I think that's all part of it. General, continuing on with that, and I think I heard in that answer that you said it's high right now. So if demand is increasing in capacity, would decrease under the Army's reported plans. So wouldn't that negatively impact both operational and personnel tempo? Um, again, what we're, we would like to decrease tempo, purse tempo for, for everybody um, that's out there. Right, so but I understand if, it's, if it actually is increasing, uh, wouldn't decreasing uh, under the Army's reported plans, wouldn't that negatively impact operation and personnel tempo? Um, I mean, they seem like to be going in opposite directions. I mean, if you're talking very basically like that, I would love to come over and have a, a, a detailed conversation with you on this, um, Senator, really for everybody about this. Thank you, General. So uh, I hope that we can make some reasonable decisions here. I look forward to that, uh, that conversation uh, that are in the best interests of the Army and the Joint Force as a whole. So I'm going to be following this closely. Uh, and I would love detailed updates as the department's planning progresses. But in my final uh, time here, I want to ask on a different topic. When we spoke in my office, you mentioned the Army needs to improve its marketing strategy to address the recruiting crisis. You've mentioned recruiting a bit before. But what strategies and tools, a little different question, what strategies and, and tools would you suggest to improve Army recruiting? I'll give you one quick example. Um, Senator, I heard this when I was out with a recruiting company commander. 
um, I don't remember if it was Oklahoma or Texas was one of the others, and they said, hey, if you're, you're nationally, your national message might be, um, you know, buy a certain kind of vehicle, and, you know, out here we buy Ford 150s, that's what it is. And so, you know, how do we tailor local messages to local? That's one thing that I think that we have to look at because it, we're different and we're trying to appeal to a very broad, you know, we want to come from across society. And so I think that we have to look at it in detail from the local markets all the way up to the larger markets. And that's what we need to do. Thank you, General. Chairman, the time expired. Thank you, Senator Bud. Uh, Senator Hirono, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> General George, welcome. Thank you very much for your service and your commitment to continuing to serve. And of course, uh, aloha to your family because we all know that when you serve, your family also serves. We've had over the last two days the uh, hearings on two really important nomina nominations. Yesterday was uh, General Brown to be the chair of the Joint Chiefs, and today you to be the chief of staff for the Army. It has been made abundantly clear how damaging the holds uh, that Senator Tupper Bill has placed on um, military promotions uh, is. And uh, yesterday, I note that Senator Tupper Bill, in his questioning of, of uh, General Brown for his position, said if there's anything he can do to help General Brown. And I would say, and I would join my colleagues in saying, Senator Tupper Bill, you have made your point and uh, I ask you to lift your hold because, as I said, it has been made abundantly clear by all of you testifying that, uh, that, that these holds are creating uh, much damage to our readiness, our uh, ability of our military to proceed. So there's that for Senator Tupperville. General George, as part of my responsibilities, I want to ensure the fitness of all nominees who come before any of the committees on which I serve uh, for, for uh, fitness to serve. And I ask the following two initial questions. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, Senator. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, I haven't, Senator. General George, I, I've been sitting here for a while, and I, I very much appreciate your very thoughtful responses to the questions that have been put to you, and especially uh, relating to uh, very sensitive issues such as suicide, and I would say the continuing scourge of sexual assault and harassment in the military. I appreciate your thoughtful responses. As a chair of the Readiness Subcommittee, I have made very clear the importance of infrastructure as a top priority. And the Army, like every service, has a deep backlog of maintenance and modernization for its facilities and basic infrastructure. And in, in fact, in Hawaii, there is a backlog of almost $5 billion in facilities maintenance and modernization. And that, that is the, the deficit, and we discussed this yesterday. Uh, wh where d does infrastructure replacement, repair, and maintenance stand in your order of priorities for uh, the Army? Um, I, well, I'll tell you, Senator, that it's, it's integral. Our job is to be prepared for to fight and win our nation's wars and having the right infrastructure depending on what it is, is a critical aspect of that. Um, you know in, in Hawaii how critical uh, Schofield and everything that we have out there, the training area PTA yes. is to us mm -hmm. um, out there. So we have to pay attention to that. It gets to recruiting as well. If you're not, if you don't have the right infrastructure, um, you know, that has an impact on your workforce. And so I would say it's, it's uh, of critical importance to us. There is such a huge uh, infrastructure deficit throughout the DOD, but you know the, mil the Army has a huge presence in Hawaii as well as in other places. And I, what, what I'd like to see going forward under your leadership is a more obvious commitment to infrastructure replacement, maintenance, uh, modernization. Um, I, I don't really see that as a, a as a commitment. We wait until things fall apart. You know, where, where electricity goes out at Tripler, the major hospital in Hawaii, and, and you can't have that. And, and not to mention the, the huge um, concerns regarding Red Hill. 
So uh, you did mention the importance of renegotiating our leases for training, uh, especially Pohakaloa, and part of the, those renegotiations is very much talking with the community. So I, I'd like to have your commitment that you will make sure that that, that kind of outreach is occurring. The, the last thing we need to happen for these really critical training areas is some concerns raised that we have not addressed due to some lack of outreach and uh, continuing uh, discussions with, especially the Native Hawaiian community. I, I agree with you 100%, Senator, and we, we, will, we will partner with the local community. I know they're doing that right now. And as, for, as, as we're doing these leases, I think uh, that there may be an opportunity for uh, the Army to really look at its needs and um, uh, return some of the land to the state, so that kind of a process, I think, is very important. I hope you will conduct that and uh, with a view of returning land that you don't need to the state. Okay, Senator. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rona. Senator Mullen, please. Thank you, Chairman. And I, I, um, I, I, I honestly had no intention of addressing this, but I have to because it seems like my colleagues from the other side continue to bring up. The, the Tuberville hold, and they're leaving a factor out of this that Chuck Schumer can bring this up for a vote anytime he wants to. Secretary Austin can come here and address his concerns anytime he wants to. Um, uh, Senator Tuberville has the right to, to put a hold on it because he believes something is illegal. He believes that uh, Secretary Austin is going outside of Code 1093. 1093 was a code, was a law that was passed that President Biden, for my colleagues that may not know the history of this, President Biden voted for that was very clear that allowed exceptions only in three cases for the armed services to pay and assist in any circumstances for an abortion. That's the law. And if we don't like the law, then we have the right as a body to change it. But yet we're, we're ignoring that issue. And if Secretary Austin believes that it is within his authority to do so, then he can come in here with his team of attorneys and Chairman Reed, you can have a hearing on it and he can explain it to all of us. Or Chuck Schumer can simply bring it to the floor for a vote, and we can all vote on it and say we don't believe in law anymore and we want to dissolve it. But my colleague has the right to put a hold on it. So we can continue to gripe about it all we want, but it's within his right to do it. And it's within our body to address his concerns if we choose to, but we're all ignoring that issue. So I think my colleagues should probably refocus on themselves and call on Chuck Schumer or this committee to have a hearing on it. With that being said, I'll quit my rant. Um, General George, pleasure seeing you again. I, I truly think we have developed a friendship. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I appreciate you, and Miss George, your sacrifice, holy smokes. Um, between you and your service and, uh, and um, uh, your husband's service and the way you guys have held a family together is remarkable. Uh, I, I just commend you guys. My heart goes out for you. The sacrifice and service that you have made and your children have made. Um, I just thank you. Thank you for, for giving us this opportunity. I, I, I get thanked all the time for my service and I stop and I say, no, there isn't one of us could do this if you all didn't do your job and do it well. So God bless you and God bless your family. Uh, and I, I, wish you, uh, I wish you all the luck. And I'm going to just end this because I really don't have any question for you because we have met multiple times. I really thank you for your interest in our uh, Munition Depot in McAllister, uh, of course, Fort Sill. I look forward to, uh, to the time we get you back in Oklahoma and we get a tour of those facilities along with Tinker and maybe even Vance and, and Altus. So um, Godspeed, and that you understand you do have a friend of me, and I'm, I'm here wanting to get in the boat and row in the same direction with you and, and, uh, and continue to make this, this country stand out and be the greatest nation in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Mullins. Senator Duckworth, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to correct the record here. Senator Tuberville has been given multiple off-ramps. He was offered a vote on Senator Ernst's bill, which was far, uh, uh, much more overall encompassing. He has been given lots of opportunities, and he's simply refusing to lift a hold. For the first time in over 100 years, we do not have a commandant of the Marine Corps, someone who can have the full power and authority of a of a commandant. Uh, this is absolutely unacceptable. We have all of these officers and their families 
My colleagues talk about and laud the family members for, for their service. We have family members who are being pulled out of schools, unable to start a new school term. We have spouses who cannot start a new job, who've lost their jobs. The entire military readiness is slowly grinding to a halt, and it is going to get worse every single day because Senator Tuberville has injected politics into this. And let me make it clear. DOD statute is very clear. The DOD cannot fund abortions. And the DOD is not funding abortions. The DOD is simply providing the ability for service members to travel to a different state from the one to, in which they are uh, assigned in order to receive reproductive health care. The DOD is not paying for those abortions. It's simply saying if you cannot get the reproductive health care you need, whether that is an abortion or IVF or an IUD or whatever that is, then you should be able to travel someplace for that. And you know who gets hurt the most on this? Our lowest ranking. It is the youngest women in the military. It is the spouses of the youngest men in the military who have to ask for a pass from their sergeants to leave their duty station so that they can go take care of their health care needs. And what we are telling them, what Senator Tuberville is telling them is, I don't care about you. Thank you for your service, but you cannot take care of your own health care or your spouse's health care. And to simply put this as this is a political thing and this is about uh, uh, um, the military providing abortion is absolutely categorically untrue because the military is not providing abortions in this instance. Now, let me also be clear that uh, uh, our men and women in uniform face so many hardships, they should be able to take care of themselves and their family members. Bottom line, and, and if there's anybody that's injecting politics into this, it's Senator Tuberville, who's fundraising, he's fundraising off of his hold on the military leadership that is affecting the national security of this country. If he truly cared about this, he wouldn't be fundraising off of it. That is my rant. Now, General George, good morning and welcome to you and your family, and congratulations on your nomination. I'm just going to skip all my preamble and just get to the point. General George, if confirmed, how would you direct the Army to prepare for a combat scenario where peer adversaries target our supply webs and logistical networks? This follows up on our conversation that we had. I care deeply about contested logistics. Um, what efforts does the Army need to adopt to enhance resilience and effectiveness in a contested logistics environment? And how can Congress contribute to these efforts? We, we talked about this a little bit, and I wanted you to be able to elaborate on that here. Yes, thanks, Senator. Um, we have stood up a, a con, uh, contested logistics, so we share your concern on this. It's, it's absolutely critical, and this will be a partnership with uh, really Army Futures Command is leading it um, with Army Material Command. Um, but th it's a challenge for us, and I think really for our, our country, um, from the strategic level, we've talked a lot this morning about an in industrial base, um, but that's strategic readiness. And so making sure that you're protecting that um, and ammunition and, and what we're producing back here. Um, and then the same thing with, uh, you know, ports and getting things in operational logistics all the way down to what we can do to tactical logistics. So it's a very... I think you've, I know you're familiar with the, you know, the term that, you know, logistics is for professionals. I mean, it's very challenging, very hard, and I think we're going to have to really partner. I know the joint force is thinking about this, and really it's going to take all of us together to make sure that we're as ready as we can be. Thank you. Can, can you drill down a little bit on your experience um, as a commander uh, uh, and, and your multiple deployments in OIF and OEF? Um, dealing with operational logistics, um, especially energy, uh, batteries for radios, uh, uh, diesel fuel, um, but then also talk a little bit about supply parts um, and perhaps the need for having additive uh, uh, metals milling equipment downrange so that we can produce some of our own uh, repair parts. Yeah, I mean, thanks for um, this because it hadn't come up, Senator. As, you know, as I'll give an example. When I was a, a brigade head of Light Brigade, BCT, in uh, eastern Afghanistan, we, we lost soldiers because we had to move, you know, fuel um, and parts and do those kinds of things, so very, in very dangerous territory. Whatever we can do, I think that uh, reducing fuel consumption um, makes us more nimble on the battlefield and will obviously make a difference in the Pacific, but really anywhere, so, you know, battery um, increasing um, that. 
I also, uh, what I also like about that is that when you have, a lot of our vehicles have thermal sites, have different sites. When you are able to have, you know, the engine isn't running and you have silent watch, um, I think that makes you also more lethal. So we are focused on those kinds of things. For the individual soldier, I think it's also important because nobody likes to carry a lot of heavy batteries. So whatever we can do to also lighten that load, um, and we're working on all of those things. The fewer batteries they carry, the more ammo they can carry, That's right? exactly right, yes, Thank Senator. you. Who up? Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Uh, Senator Cotton, please. General, uh, General George, uh, welcome and congratulations on your nomination. Thanks for your lifetime of service. Mrs. George, thank you as well. Um, I, I know that uh, several senators have addressed with you the recruiting challenge. I really I'd call it the recruiting crisis that the Army faces. I think this is the number one challenge, certainly the most urgent challenge you have to address. Some things are beyond your control. You can't control rising wages in the private sector. <clears throat> you can't control a shrinking teenage population or 20-something population in our country, but some things will be in your control. And I would just add my voice to all of those other senators about trying to address those concerns, about expanding eligibility pools, making it easier to push waiver authority down from the general officer level to the field or even company grade level, addressing some of the perceptions of political correctness in the military and so forth. Um, this is a tough challenge. I hope you succeed. The nation needs you to succeed, but I think it's probably gonna be the one of the main things that your tenure is measured by if you can't succeed. Uh, second, um, we discussed this yesterday. Uh, I want to uh, put it on the record, though. The caisson platoon at the Old Guard uh, is a very special unit. Normally, we wouldn't talk about platoons or even regiments at a hearing like this, but the Old Guard is a uh, regiment uh, of national importance. It doesn't just perform in, um, at ceremonies at the White House and state funerals, but it also performs military fun honors funerals every single day. And because uh, of right now the stand down of the caisson platoon, there are not uh, um, caissons being used with horses in Arlington National Cemetery. And every day that goes by, that that's not happening, that means a veteran who earned those honors and a family who is there for the funeral is not receiving them. Um, so can I get your commitment on the record that the Army does not intend to end or eliminate the caisson platoon? Um, Senators, no intention to eliminate Thank that you. capability. And, and I, I know that the Army has laid out a path forward. I, I think it is up to a year, maybe a little bit less than a year now. Can I get your commitment as well that you will try to do everything you can to accelerate that process and get horses back operating with the case on platoon in Arlington National Cemetery? Yes, Senator, that's our goal, to accelerate. Okay. Finally, I want to address um, the ongoing saga about the Army's combat fitness test and gender-neutral standards. We've talked about this. You've heard me talk to your predecessor and Secretary Wormuth about it. For years, the Army said they would have general neutral standards under the combat fitness test. Last spring, uh, the last minute, the Army decided not to do that. This committee and the NDA directed it to have gender neutral standards in the combat arms branches. Um, Secretary Wormuth and her army of uh, lawyers found a way to say that they didn't need to do that. So here we are this year with Congress being more directed. The House of Representatives, in language uh, proposed by Representative Waltz includes a directive that the Army should impose, one, gender-neutral standards in combat arms branches, and two, those standards have to be higher than they are for the Army as a whole. Because frankly, the Army standards are kind of pathetic. The Army standards require you to run two miles in 22 or 23 minutes. And it, let me, I say run. I want the record to report that I use sarcastic air quotes with my fingers when I say run because moving two miles in 23 minutes is not running. Maybe shuffling, but it's not running. This committee tried to have the same approach, at least I did, that Representative Waltz proposed, but the Army came back to us and said they would rather revert to the old Army physical fitness test, the old-fashioned two-mile run, push-ups and sit-ups, and use gender-specific standards. So what I sense is an ideological opposition in the Secretary of the Army's office to having gender-neutral standards for the combat arms branches. I just want to read you something and see if I can get your agreement on it. While it may be difficult for a 120-pound woman to lift or drag 250 pounds, the Army cannot artificially absolve women of that responsibility. It may still exist on the battlefield. The entire purpose of creating a gender-neutral test was to acknowledge the reality that each job has objective physical standards to which all soldiers should be held, regardless of gender. The intent was not to ensure that women and men will have an equal likelihood of meeting those standards. 
General, do you agree with that sentiment? Yes, Senator, I do. Thank you. It was uh, given by one of your officers, Captain Kristen Greest. Uh, she may be a major by now. She was one of the Army's very first female infantry officers and one of the first graduates of the Ranger School. So I think she should know what she's talking about. So to be clear, I, I don't want the Army necessarily to return to the old Army physical fitness test. I'm fine if they keep the combat fitness test. I do expect the Army to have gender neutral standards for the combat arms branches in which ground combat roles have irreducible physical demands. So can I get your commitment that you'll work with this committee and with the House Armed Services Committee to move forward in a way that achieves your objectives with the combat fitness test, but also ensures that we have gender neutral and higher standards for those demanding combat arms branches? Um, you have my commitment, Senator, and I would like to, um, I do like to, the Army combat fitness test. I think it's a great test. I think it's changing um, the fitness culture. Um, so far, we've been doing this through the active component for this last year, and we're getting ready to do it in Compost 2 and 3, so the National Guard and the Army Reserve. Um, I was thinking back to when I first came on. I, th I think this is important because this will help us set a good baseline and decide where the standards are when I first came in. Um, enlisted in the Army. I know by the time I was a lieutenant, the standards were a lot different, a lot higher, and that's what we need, and that's what we need to do. So we would like to, you know, take the time to make sure that we're doing this appropriately um, and have them set the right way. Good. I'm glad to hear that because, again, it wasn't my idea to say the Army should revert to the physical fitness test as opposed to the combat fitness test. It was the secretary's office and some of my Democratic friends who had such an ideological opposition to gender neutral standards that you and I and Captain Greist all think that the Army should have. So I'm happy to work with you on that. I'm happy for the Army to have gender specific standards in profession or in branches and MOSs that don't require those same kind of demanding physical positions like an intelligence analyst or a systems network or anything, any other kind of jobs. But in things like the infantry and artillery and armor, I think we can all agree that there are irreducible physical demands that we have to ensure male and female soldiers alike can meet on the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General George, uh, welcome. Good to see you uh, again, and uh, congratulations uh, on your nomination as well. Uh, General George, for, uh, as you're well aware, for, for decades uh, the Army has prepared soldiers uh, for deployment overseas through the use of uh, validation uh, exercises conducted either at uh, JRTC or NTC. Uh, these exercises are, of course, of critical importance to allow soldiers and their commanders to conduct training that they may not be able to receive at their home station, uh, with, and it can be uh, training with larger formations and supporting units necessary for success when they deploy overseas. I, I believe this is especially true, and I think you'd agree, for reserve components and for the National Guard. Uh, but as the Army places more emphasis on the need to fight in the cyber and space domains and in contested and degraded uh, EW environments, uh, I'm, I'm becoming concerned uh, that uh, this, this model leaves National Guardsmen ill-prepared for participation in validation exercises and, more importantly, for deployment uh, downrange. Uh, I think we need to be investing more in National Guard exercises and installations that can host the type of large-scale combat operations that include uh, cyber uh, and EW effects to better prepare our troops. So my question for you, sir, is uh, what, if any, changes need to be made to the current validation exercise training model to better prepare soldiers, especially National Guardsmen, uh, for the threats that they're facing uh, in the coming years? Um, well, I think a couple of things, Senator. Um, you're, you're right that we have to evolve here and adapt on how we're going to train in a multi-domain environment. Um, and in, in some, some areas, that's going to be difficult regardless of where that is. I think we was talking to Senator Kelly earlier about how much altitude, you know, airspace you own, what you are allowed to do with, uh, you know, signals and EW and those kinds of things. So. Um, uh, we are looking at that. I think simulations is going to be a big part of that, too, to allow people to train in that environment, um, much like we do uh, with some of the cyber that can do more remote. So I think it's going to be a combination of things. I know this is something that we are talking about uh, a lot on our, on our training side inside of our G3 um, to figure out how we're going to move forward. And, and the Army is a total Army. We all have to come together. 
Um, grayling is one of those spots that we talked about um, that you can do a lot of those kind, that kind of training as well. I know there's a, I think Northern Strike is coming up um, soon. Right. Um, and so those kind of locations, I think, where you can get after multi-domain training and much like we're doing with those exercises, I think that will also help us. Right. Well, and we talked about uh, that facility. Uh, I understand uh, you trained there yourself uh, as a, uh, a young lieutenant, and I appreciated uh, your offer if confirmed to come up and, uh, and to see the facility again, because it's certainly that type of facility that can help uh, facilitate that. So I look forward to working with you if uh, confirmed. General, General, um, as uh, the Army continues development of autonomous uh, mobility platforms, uh, an enterprise-wide solution to data collection and management is going to be, without question, uh, vital. Uh, uh, to ensure that the relevant program executive offices and their respective program managers don't silo, uh, silo ed uh, vehicle specific solutions uh, to the challenge posed by autonomous uh, mobility. Uh, I would argue that that type of error would leave the department susceptible to a vendor lock-in of boutique solutions uh, and would prevent the efficiencies that can be gained from basically service-wide use of data sets uh, to build uh, AI LML uh, algorithms. So my question for you is, uh, do you believe that the current Army approach to autonomous uh, mobility is sufficient to meet the challenges in an affordable and timely manner? And what structured changes, uh, including potentially the creation of a PEO focused on ground autonomy, do you think needs to be made uh, to ensure that the uh, Army is uh, moving on the cutting edge uh, of this uh, technology in, in this field. Um, Senator, uh, I want to go to the, your question first on the, on the PEO. I think uh, just like we're doing in the cross-functional teams, and we've done this, I think ASALT, Mr. Bush has done this recently with making some adjustments. Um, you can't let your structure get in the way of how you have to adjust your force and what you're going to need on the battlefield to win. So, yes, we are going to have to look, you know, look at that and see how we're doing that. And I think that, that we are. There's been some recent changes that we've done. I mentioned added a cross-functional team and taken things that we need to do that. Um, autonomous systems uh, is a good example of where we need to really partner with the commercial you know, American ingenuity, I think we see that up in um, Detroit as right. an example, um, that it's happening out there and that's, we need to have those kind of partnerships. Um, I, th I think what we're looking at is everything that we're, we're building, we need to make sure has open architecture. This gets to your question, you know, to your issue on vendor lock to make sure that we have the ability to, or not locked into that, that we have an open architecture, that we can easily adapt these systems. Um, I think that that's the way we're going to have to do this if we're going to continue to evolve. Great. Honorable. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Enjoyed our visit in the office. And as I told you, my grandfather was a uh, infantryman in the Army during World War II. And, um, um, was very proud of his service. We're proud of his service, and thank you for your service. Um, <clears throat> I guess a couple of questions, and, and I know I ask you this, um, more of a statement, but also, I guess, a response. I just think whatever we can do to depoliticize what's happening right now in the military, I think, is paramount. I mean, I think it goes to recruiting challenges. It goes to public trust. And based on our conversation, it sounds like that's, you are on the same page of, of keeping politics, no matter whose it is, um, out of the military and just be the best war fighting military in the history of the world. And you would agree with that statement, correct? I would agree with that, Senator. Okay. And then um, as it sort of rubber kind of meets the road here, um, as uh, our pacing challenge, biggest threat, whatever you want to call a communist China, they are that. And um, just curious to hear your, and you may have asked this, but this is the downside of being the last one on the on the dais here to ask questions, uh, but your view of how the Army, um, in many ways the Army's done this before, um, but not as recently, and how you think um, under, under your command here um, the Army evolves or does things differently to, to face that, that threat in the Indo-PACOM theater. Okay, thanks for that question, um, Senator. I think uh, you know, first is just to make sure you were talking earlier about perceptions that 
Um, it's very much a joint theater out in the Pacific. I think the Army has a big role, as we know from history, um, we did back in, in, in World War II when there was actual fighting out there. So I think for deterrence and everything, we'll have a huge role as part of the joint team. Um, I could go down um, several of the contested logistics came up. I think the Army will have a significant role in that. Um, integrated air and missile defense. The Army is kind of will lead the way and have a um, will be very important to the theater in that. Long range fires, I think, are are critical. Very hard, as you've seen. Uh, I think it's a big deterrence as well. It's very hard to um, dynamically target things that are on the ground and can hide in that clutter. And um, so, I think our long range fires. Um, we have already have two multi-domain task force that are out there operating and um, exercising out there. So I think that will be critical. And then uh, the, the Army is really has your close combat force. You know, that's what I've grown up in, in those. And you're going to need those to secure things, and you're going to need them. Um, we're always going to need offensive um, capability, and I think on the land as a land power, and I think we'll need that. And um, you mentioned logistics, too, and as you know, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, we've trained a lot of uh, great personnel to, to deal with logistics. As far as, this is the last question before I yield back, uh, as far as needs go um, by way of weapon systems, generally speaking, what is it that you think um, as, we, as we turn our attention more in, uh, intensely towards China and that theater, what is the greatest need there? Well, I will tell you, I've been, uh, I think what's been great in the Army is we've had a, a very good plan and stuck to it for the last several years. Uh, long range fires is a, is a good example of that across that portfolio. Same with integrated air and missile defense. One of the areas that we're really focusing on now um, to kind of add that rolls into that is uh, countering unmanned systems. So counter UAS, it's a different threat. Um, and how we're focused on that. And so we're, we have, you know, we, the Army is now the executive agent for that and investing more in that. And I think that that's going to be another one of those that we're going to have to rapidly evolve in, Senator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Schmidt. Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, uh, congratulations on your nomination. I want to thank you and your family for your exceptional service. It's, uh, I think you're highly qualified, and I'm looking forward to strongly supporting your confirmation. Um, so thank you to your family as well. Um, I just got back from the NATO summit last night late and uh, had the opportunity to visit with the 1st Cav troops in Lithuania who are doing an exceptional job. So I know you know that, but I wanted you to know that we had a CODEL, bipartisan CODEL of senators who spent a couple hours with them and look like they're doing great. Morale's high, and I think they understand the importance of their mission. Um, I do want to just touch on the recruiting issues, maybe have a comment or two on what we can focus on. I was disappointed, to be honest, and I don't like to get into the politicization issues, but at a roundtable event, Secretary uh, Warmerth just last week um, talked about one of her concerns on recruiting was politicians uh, labeling the Army as woke, as damaging recruiting efforts. That was her comment. I think the secretary, best way that she can address this kind of issue is not to blame politicians, but just to make sure that the Army is indeed not so-called woke. Have you seen that Emma recruiting ad, Army Emma recruiting ad? You know what I'm talking about? Um, I don't think I have seen it, but I will. Yeah, this is Exhibit A in a woke army, in my view. I have no idea who the army was trying to get with that ad. But it was an embarrassment, I thought, and it was taken down, I believe. Take a look at it. But the secretary was a joke, in my view. Um, I have no idea. It would be good to know, maybe for the record, who, who approved that and what, what the goal? Who were who, who we trying to get? I just it's not on politicians. Secretary, I was 
disappointed to see the secretary kind of defend blame on an issue like this. What What are your thoughts on on the recruiting issues? I'm um, just specific to that point, Senator. I think uh, again, people are staying inside of our formations. I know that. Uh, um, we are focused on our mission, as you've seen with uh, out there with the troops, and we got to get the word out about how the army and the military in general can accelerate your life and why yeah. it's a great place to serve. Um, and we're working hard to do that. Okay, um, let me uh, let me turn to the eleventh air um, the eleventh airborne division. Um, I, I really want to commend you and General McConville and the secretary for that. Uh, uh, decision and um, I was back home last weekend as well and uh, it seems like that unit is doing exceptionally well we still are having these suicide these high levels of suicide in Alaska which of course is horrendous heartbreaking can you give me an update on how you think in the 11th Airborne is doing and then can I get a commitment from you I do think our leadership in Alaska and the Army has really put a lot of effort and focus on these really difficult issues of mental health and suicide. So I'm not criticizing at all here, but I, I'd like your commitment to continue to focus on that, particularly in my state, particularly some of the MILCON projects that are coming on board that I think are gonna be positive. But uh, can you comment on 11th Airborne, how you think they're doing? I know that you had mentioned in a hearing a couple months ago, it's the number one requested uh, place they did a big uh, big jump on the anniversary of the um, patching so uh, I'd love to hear your views on that and again a commitment on continuing that focus on the challenges of suicide in Alaska um, first of all absolutely chairman you have my commitment um, you know taking building cohesive teams and taking care of soldiers and families is is of our top priority um, we're, we're actually proud of what 11th Airborne is, is, is doing up there. And I, um, yes, we are, it is a, an, a enlistment incentive to do assignment of choice. A lot of people like to go up there to the North Country and, and serve in that. And we have seen that up there. Um, people are proud to be part of that Airborne unit. Um, we're proud of what they're Good doing. Good to have the 82nd have a little competition, right? Uh, I'm sure there is a little bit of competition. That you know how things work. Yeah, I do know, how <laughs> and I'm gl I'm glad they have a little competition. I, I think the chairman was part of the 82nd at one point, but all right. Uh, but yes, we're proud. We're proud of what they're doing. I actually, uh, and I'm, I I think what they're doing up with Mission 100. I I think you might be familiar with that. Um, I always give Alaska as the example of you know to tackle any problem, you have to you know let a commander make them responsible, hold them responsible and accountable, but give them the resources and do things different. Alaska is different than um, Fort Liberty or anywhere else. And so they've done some very innovative things up there. Um, I think changing to 11th Airborne was a big, is a, is a big plus. They're doing hard yeah. um, training up there and their ethos, which I think helps um, with a lot of things as well. So we're really proud of what 11th Airborne I, I would agree with that, General, and, and seeing the morale that seems to be uh, better because of their mission-oriented focus. They know what they're all about. They got a, yep. they have a uh, war fighting headquarters, I think, which made it makes a difference as well. Let me ask one final question, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay. Um, you know, I've been, I, I know that you're looking at a, additional multi-domain task force locations and I want to get your assessment on how you think that's going, but also your commitment. I know you can't say yes or no right now, but to work with me in this committee on the possibility of a multi-domain task force in Alaska. We have the best training in the world. Our strategic location is unrivaled. The father of the Air Force, Billy Mitchell, called Alaska the most strategic place on the planet. A number of services are recognizing that you know, you're six hours from Korea, Japan, the Taiwan Strait. A lot of flag officers actually don't recognize that even though we're uh, not west of the International Dateline, we're closer to the fight in the Pacific and even in Europe, given our strategic location. So can you just give me an assessment on how you guys are looking at the next 
location for a multi-domain task force and commit to me to working with this committee on the possibility of having one in Alaska? Um, we have not made any final decisions. We're still working through that and uh, absolutely um, committed to working with the committee. And is the Senator. goal one or two more multi-domain task force? Uh, the, the plan is for two additional multi-domain task force. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, I want to make one or announcement and two, a few follow-up questions. Uh, in the discussion today, there was the issue of when our committee is going to be briefed on the legality of the Secretary of Defense's policy regarding reproductive rights, uh, pursuant to an, an amendment that we voted on in the NDA markup. Uh, there will be a briefing next Wednesday morning for all SAS members. Uh, so I encourage all of our colleagues to come and to receive a thorough briefing on the legality of his uh, position. The other issue that comes up consistently is, you know, uh, why don't we just take a vote on these 251 nominees that are on the floor? There are more in committee. And every day or every week, this will grow and grow and grow. And I just want to remind everyone that uh, Senator Tuberville and others who are insisting on these votes are also insisting on we follow all the procedures, which includes uh, cloture, uh, time pre and post cloture. Uh, for the 251 nominations, that would take 668 hours. Uh, that's 27 days if we work around the clock, and we typically don't work around the clock. It would be 84 days if we worked eight hours a day. Uh, that is an impossible goal to achieve. And by the way, that would prevent us from dealing with issues like the National Defense Authorization Act, appropriations bill, and other uh, important legislation. So this, this notion of just let's take a vote is, I think, uh, indefensible based on the fact that it's virtually impossible to do that. The other aspect here, too, with respect to readiness, is that even if we took a vote on a, say, your nomination general and went through all the procedures, et cetera, uh, you would not have a vice chief of staff, correct? That's correct. Who would perform the role of vice chief of staff? Um, I mean, we're still working through this because I think we're a little bit in uncharted territory, but we would have to, you know, look for people across the staff to kind of pick up some of those duties where they could. And, of course, that affects readiness. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Chairman, it's just having the right, if you don't have the right people, it's, there's a reason we have these positions and have these people in place, and you always want to field a full team. So you want your full team on the field. And the uh, joint, the, the vice chief of staff for the Army is a member of JROC, the Joint Requirements Commission? Yeah, I would, uh, having done this for the last year, the vice job is very busy. So uh, who would represent the Army on the JROC? So we would, again, have to look at the G3 or the director of the Army staff or, you know, look at those and there's... That's challenging as well. And of course, those general officers would be three stars, not four, and all the other vices would be four. Is that correct? That's correct, Chairman. And it was interesting because on our debate in the committee, uh, there was a, a decision to increase the rank of the Deputy Commanding General National Guard Bureau to four stars because the logic was without the fourth star, he would be dismissed by his superiors, he would not what could weigh in effectively, and it's probably the same case. Uh, you might argue in in the JROC, and the JROC sets all of our requirements going forward. So the Army would be represented by somebody, but somebody who is not really the Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Right, right leader with the right experience in the right place is exactly what we want, Chairman. And you would not have that. We would not have that. Even if you were confirmed as the chair. That's correct, Chairman. And that readiness situation would go down uh, the chain of command. For example, the 
designated uh, vice chief is the director of the joint staff right now. So That's his correct. position, and, and he could, he would be waiting to move, and also someone else would be waiting to take his place. So we'd be in this sort of perpetual who's on first situation. Um, and that affects readiness. Yes, it does, Chairman. So even if uh, we decided to uh, confirm you, there would be a significant impact on readiness in the United States Army. Yeah, I would agree with that, Chairman. Yes. Yeah. No. That's one issue that I think has to be understood. There's a second issue, too. Uh, this discussion about the woke army, diversity, it, uh, all of the things we're doing that is just um, unmilitary strikes me as, as wrong. I, America is a diverse country, and we have to have the diverse army. Is that your position? Yes, Chairman, that's my position. And in fact, um, as we bring more people into the service from diverse backgrounds, we tend to get much more quality. Is that correct also? That's correct. Now, I had the, the privilege of uh, serving under a, a battalion commander at 82nd who was an African American, and he was a tremendous leader. And I think that uh, continues, in not just in terms of uh, racial, but also ethnicity and other aspects that we have to look at. Now, there's been the suggestion, I think, by so many of my colleagues that this wokeism is what's causing the recruiting problem. The Army conducted a survey on February 22nd, 2023, published a survey, the Army Pulse Survey. You're familiar with that? I am, Chairman, yes. The number one reason that uh, this respondents gave for why they would not join the army, I'd be putting the rest of my life on hold. You said that several times. That's 21 percent. The second highest response at 13 percent was women and racial or ethnic minorities that are discriminated against the army, uh, against in the army, which goes back to our question of don't we need diversity training and such training so that people do not feel as if they're going to be categorized and discriminated? I, I think we do, Chairman, and as you know, we've been doing that and should, con that's part of building a cohesive team and bringing everybody together. We absolutely have to do that. When you look for the woke category, uh, and by the way, those two categories together are 34 percent. When you look at the woke category, uh, and the question was asked, the Army is placing too much emphasis on the wokeness, in other words, diversity, equity, training, marginalizing those with conservative views, et cetera, that's 5 percent. Now, that's not something that you can dismiss, but that's not the most significant by a long shot reason or not people are not coming in the Army. Is that your conclusion? I think I agree with you. We can't dismiss anything, and we got to get after perceptions. Just like I was telling you before, the Army is a great place to serve. I know that. I believe that with all of my heart, and we've got to get that out there. Um, it's, you're going to accelerate your life. You're going to have a good experience. You're going to have good leaders out there, um, and we're focused on our mission. So I think we have to attack them all and keep getting people into our formation. Chairman. I agree, but, I, uh, but this notion that um, the Army, you know, people are just turning their backs on the Army en masse in huge numbers because it's woke is not borne out by the analysis. That's not what we found in the Thank survey. You. Now, the other suggestion or implication about a lot of these comments is that all the Army does is stand around and have kind of psychotherapy sessions uh, all day long. Uh, you're, I'm sure, familiar with uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major Grinson. He was asked essentially this question about readiness and training and maintaining standards, and his answer, I think, is very revealing. He was asked in the House, Congressman, yes, we've maintained our standards, and I would say that when I look at it, there is one hour of equal opportunity training in basic training and 92 hours of rifle marksmanship training. And if you go to OCET, there's 165 hours of rifle marksmanship training and still only one hour of equal opportunity training. So the emphasis in the Army is where it should be, the skills to fight, 
to lead, to succeed. And supporting that is a response to one of the major issues that people see as a problem in the element. Discrimination uh, against women, against minorities, et cetera. So you're going to, you are keeping the army on target, no pun intended, uh, and that's why the army is deploying so successfully. That's why when you go to places like Lithuania or the Pacific, you see extraordinarily professional forces that are doing their job every day, and we do have to get the message out. And I think your point too that. Um, messages have to be tailored to the audience makes a great deal of sense. Uh, and uh, again, I, I was, uh, I think this whole uh, situation of stopping uh, the confirmation of military officers for political reason, and this is a political reason, there's no more political issue in this country than re reproductive rights, et cetera. Uh, is wrong. And I last evening um, saw on Fox News a, a Marine Corps Medal of Honor winner who was very outraged that the, the Commandant could not be confirmed in a reasonable manner. Uh, any further comments, sir? Um, I, I agree with you. We'd like to get our leaders in the right place. And again, I. Um this didn't come up, but there, yeah, as it impacts family, I do worry longer term about what younger officers are seeing, and I, we, you know, we don't want that either. So I agree. We'd like to get this resolved. Thank you. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your wife's service. Uh, and again, I'll reiterate. And back in 1971, uh, PDI, right? Oh, PDA, right? It's PDA. PDA. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting old. PDA. Statue of limitations on that. Sorry. Is, is there? I'm sorry about <laughs> that, sir. But uh, you know, uh, I don't know how they handled it now. But in the old corps, we we just walked around. Uh, but. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your family service. Uh, and I'm tempted to say go Army. Go Army. Thank you. Go Army. Thanks, Chairman. The hearing is adjourned.